right. So let me jump right in. New directions. Well, the first new direction is time domain. When I first started in radio astronomy 30, 40 years ago, we thought the universe only changed in time periods of billions of years. And uh, the, the big change is saying no, there are events that occur, well, actually some in microseconds or nanoseconds, even they're very sharp pulses, uh, but uh, certainly in a millisecond time scale. And uh, uh, you heard a talk this morning on fast radio bursts. I, I'm going to touch on it also. Uh, uh, but time domain astronomy is what we have to uh, be thinking about. And this is, uh, gives new opportunities, I'd say, for uh, amateurs to do useful astronomy. Uh, and also have fun doing it. Uh, second topic, I, I, I want to just give uh, uh, one slide uh, previews or, or summaries of what I call astounding observations. Observations that were science fiction 30 years ago and now are real that we're, we're seeing now. And so uh, I'll, I'll just run through several of those, just, just one slide each. And then come down to what, what could amateurs do to help. I, I have a slide on that. And then I really switch gears and talk about uh, technology. The, uh, the low, very low noise amplifiers that I've been working on for the past uh, three or four years, they're low noise without cryogenic cooling means they're affordable uh, and that makes a big difference. Uh, I'll probably talk a little bit about current radio astronomy arrays, small telescopes. And then uh, there's a uh, favorite topic of mine, which is noise in microwave systems. And uh, I have several slides that I, I think uh, give a simplified view of noise. Uh, and there are misconceptions that I'll try to uh, address. So uh, let's go right to the next slide. Time domain astronomy. Well, the first thing to think about is that uh, there are pulses hitting the Earth. I, I, I said 500. Well, that depends on the criteria of detectability, but uh, easily detectable, I would say. There's 500 a day hitting the Earth. Uh, these are called fast radio bursts. But realize the problem. Uh, these come from random directions. Uh, they're, they're not, uh, not in the Milky Way. They're, they're now known to be extra galactic. And so they come from all over the sky. And most of them only occur once, what, what we call single event transients. Um, <clears throat> now that makes a, a, a different problem. If you have a large reflector antenna pointing it in one direction of the sky, you have little chance of detecting one of these bursts. Uh, uh, you can best detect them by either small dishes or, or just forms that see uh, much of the sky at the same time. <coughs> and, uh, uh, so that's an opportunity for people with, uh, with small antennas to uh, detect these fast radio bursts. Um, uh, now, the fact that 
most of them don't repeat. Uh, there's a big problem. And I have to tell the story of uh, how uh, these got confused. Uh, I, I guess going back about five years ago. Uh, of course, you can get a, a little burst from somebody flicking the switch somewhere. Uh, but uh, the fast radio burst has a dispersion. It means that when the pulse arrives at one frequency, it's, it's sweeping in frequency. Uh, say, say you pick it up at 1.6 gigahertz, and a few hundred milliseconds later, it's at 1.3 gigahertz. It sweeps. That sweep is very important. That helps to distinguish from somebody flicking a, a switch somewhere. Uh, uh, and that sweep is due to the plasma. It's due to the charged particles between the Earth and the source. It helps to determine the distance of the source. Uh, as uh, and if you know, uh, when uh, radio waves go through a plasma of char uh, region of uh, mostly vacuum, but with some electrons, uh, you know, uh, density in the intergalactic space is something like 0.03 electrons per cubic centimeter. Uh, but that creates a time delay which increases as the frequency uh, decreases. Uh, uh, and that is the dispersion that is measured for, for uh, pulsar. For, well, it's measured for pulsar, but it's measured for fast radio bursts. Uh, uh, so um, the confirmation uh, uh, is, is difficult. There was a uh, a false confirmation that occurred uh, three or four years ago, uh, very uh, puzzling and confusing. And it was uh, uh, some of the FRBs that, that were thought to be detected at the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. Uh, turned out to be the microwave oven in the telescope when the, uh, the telescope operator would go have his lunch and uh, he would eat his sandwich and he would open the door uh, to turn off the power of the oven. Uh, when he opened the door across uh, the, the microwaves and the oven leaked out and the power supply uh, uh, held up for a few hundred milliseconds and, and produced some sweep in frequency. Uh, so uh, it wasn't until somebody noticed that, that, uh, that there were about half a dozen FRPs that occurred at lunchtime. <laughs> and uh, th this was straightened out. And um, uh, now, uh, they're confirmed in many different sites of seeing the, the FRBs. Okay, moving on. Astounding observations, uh, what, what I would say were, uh, were science fiction 30 years ago, are, are now uh, very much uh, in the minds of the astronomers and have led to what I call astounding theories. Uh, so let, let me just go through these quickly. The first is the cosmic background. What you see here is that your eyes could see radio waves. You looked up at the sky at night or day, actually. Uh, the, the sky is not dark. Uh, 
at radio wavelengths, there is a glow to it. And the glow is the remnant of the initial explosion of the universe. Now that's a, a amazing uh, effect that uh, uh, with uh, radio waves, with, with antennas and low noise receivers, uh, we can see this glow. And uh, that has been now done many, many times at different wavelengths. Uh, 2006 Nobel Prize was awarded uh, for detection. Uh, uh, actually, I, I think there's two Nobel Prizes. There was, there was one for the detection, and then there was one for uh, uh, determining effects on general rel relativity. Uh, but, but the three uh, pictures that you see in the center of your screen uh, uh, are sort of finer and finer scale looking at the cosmic background. Uh, the average temperature is 2.725 Kelvin, but there's some uh, variation with direction in the sky. Most of, of this cosmic background is everywhere. But uh, there's a, a dipole moment of it, a redshift due to the solar systems. Uh, actually, it's, it's our galaxy moving relative to uh, the rest of the universe. And subtract out that dipole moment and then you see the one in the middle uh, the, the band in the middle is the Milky Way and then finally if you remove that you get the variation and uh, uh, that is the repeatable measurement those clumps are there for some reason and they're, they're in the range of the 100 micro Kelvin range. They're hard to see. Uh, but that's very much an ongoing uh, study and telling us much about the, the universe. That there's a theory that goes along with all this. And from that theory, uh, we can say the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Uh, uh, so, here is one slide giving the whole history of the universe in three uh, paragraphs. Uh, so this explosion occurred 13.7 billion years ago, and just hydrogen was created. Don't ask me how or why. Uh, uh, leave that to others. But the evidence of the explosion is seen in this cosmic background, or it, it, cosmic background radiation is explained by the explosion was just created hydrogen. Uh, and then in the first uh, billion years or so after this, the hydrogen clumped together. It, it was first occurred in just uh, soup. Uh, and the clumping together of the hydrogen created stars, the nuclear fusion within the stars, which created all the other elements uh, in the universe. Uh, uh, and the stars eventually explode, supernova, and spread dust, which forms planets such as Earth say the elements in our bodies came from the dust from those supernova explosions. So that's the whole history in one slide. Uh, there's a lot of details uh, to it and uh, hundreds of thousands of paper, papers and thousands of stories. Okay, the next uh, strange or astounding observation is dark matter in the universe. Astronomers will tell you that uh, 
not see, I think, that something like 96% of the universe is believed to be either uh, dark uh, matter or dark energy. Dark energy is a little stranger, but let, let's just give you a simple observation that is the background for saying just dark matter of the universe. Uh, astronomers uh, observe galaxies, such as the one in this picture, a spiral galaxy. And uh, they can observe that that galaxy is spinning. Uh, and the, the simple physics is that the galaxy would fly apart if there, if there wasn't, that there is additional mass in the galaxy that we don't see. That mass uh, holds it together. There's a, there's a, whether the spinning is stable or not depends on the mass. And so the, the evidence is that there is a large amount of mass that we don't see that holds the galaxy together. So it's a simple observation uh, that, that has a, a tremendous implication. Uh, what's, what's going on in the universe. Uh, okay, next uh, uh, astounding discovery is pulsars. Uh, and uh, uh, there are thousands of these now observed. Uh, they are believed to be spinning neutron stars uh, that, that have a beam coming out of uh, two directions of the neutron star. And what's amazing is uh, the neutron star itself, these are relatively small, maybe 10 kilometers in that diameter. They're smaller than the Earth. Uh, they have an enormous density. They are solid neutrons. Density, uh, the, the expressive, the, the units that are easier to understand, it's a uh, hundred million tons per, per cubic centimeter. Uh, so if you were holding a, um, a cubic centimeter of a neutron star in your fingers and you dropped it, gravitational force so heavy to go right through the earth, come out on the other side of the earth, then come right back through uh, to, to your fingertips. Uh, so that, that's a, a little thought experiment that uh, illustrates how massive these neutron stars are. There's now a lot of, of uh, papers about uh, how these generate uh, pulses, the streams of Radio waves. Okay, the next uh, science fiction uh, type uh, structure is black holes. Um, uh, it's a region that is so dense, has so much gravity that even light cannot escape. Uh, uh, edges of the black holes, there are these turbulence. Uh, uh, stars get swallowed by the black hole. That uh, creates, uh, well, uh, first of all, x-rays. Uh, those are observed. So uh, black holes are now observed by looking at the black holes are on periphery. Black hole. Uh, now, uh, most interesting area, I think, is this question of uh, where else is there life in the universe? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? Where is it? And uh, I believe the most interesting space. Uh, experiment is the 
Kepler Space Telescope. Most of you probably uh, heard about this, but I'll just uh, quickly uh, summarize it. Uh, it uh, looked at a small area of sky at um, uh, less than a meter apart, um, or no, it was 10 degrees by 10 degrees, where there's 100,000 stars in the image that you see in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, it, the telescope could just stare at those 100,000 stars and measure the light output of each star and uh, detect what you see in the top middle of the slide. When a planet moves in front of the star, it uh, cuts the light down, it uh, blanks out the uh, light of the star. And so you're able to detect planets for the first time. Uh, uh, and you can measure the rotation rate for the jury of the round star uh, and get a, a feeling for the size of the planet by how much of the light blocks. So uh, Kepler uh, ran for I think it was around four years, and the results well, they detected over a thousand planets, uh, and uh, they could also uh, determine the distance of the planet and to get to the question of what was the temperature of the planet. And some of them are Earth-like planets. This is one I mentioned here, Kepler 69C. It's a little bigger than the Earth, a year of 242 days, and the surface temperature of 281 Kelvin. Uh, you know, that, that's uh, cold, but uh, it could be some more light. Uh, uh, so uh, this gives uh, impetus to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And next couple of slides, I want to discuss that question. When will Earth communicate with extraterrestrial life? A uh, little chronology here. On the first five billion years of the Earth, uh, the technology to communicate with stellar distances did not, did not exist. So there could have been other civilizations that were banging on our door, uh, trying to call our attention. We have no uh, idea, no radio technology, only the past hundred years. So we have a technology. Uh, so uh, now that we have that technology, uh, how far away would this other civilization have to be? How much power would they have to emit for us to detect them? So that is uh, answered in this next slide, which uh, there are, are three cases there in red, three columns. Uh, uh, the one uh, furthest to the left is that. Oh, we are only detecting leakage radiation. That is, these other civilizations are not trying to contact us. But they have technology similar to what is on Earth. They, they have high power TV transmitters, they have radar. Uh, they are emitting about the same power as the Earth emits microwave uh, frequencies. And we call that a leakage signal. It, it, uh, it, it gives some 
numbers there of effective radiative power. And what would be important is uh, if they wanted to signal us, they wanted to call our attention, they would put that power in a narrow bandwidth. Those naturally occurring radiation, the other signals we see, when they turn into a wide, wider bandwidth, they're noise wider signals for these uh, tens or hundreds of kilohertz wide. Uh, so if we saw a carrier that was only a ten kilohertz wide, uh, that, that would be something special. So the first uh, answer is uh, with present technology, I said year 2017, still through 2021, it says we don't have our SIBO anymore, uh, with that vast, largest area on Earth. But uh, we would not detect that we could see. We could not. We could look. But uh, even if that civilization was at a distance of the nearest star, uh, we, we could not see it. Uh, there's a project uh, called the Square kilometer ray, which is, is uh, now getting started. Australia and South Africa getting started in terms of construction. Uh, the, the, the goal is a million square meters. Uh, that that won't happen at the seven point year. But with that much collecting area, there would be seven uh, planets. Uh, within the range that leakage signals would be detected, 19 light years. Well, the next columns are suppose that other civilization is really intent to contact us. Uh, they send out a beacon, and the, the middle case there is a kilowatt beacon with one hertz bandwidth. In that case, uh, even with present technology, it could be seven if there were seven planets that were doing this uh, within 19 light years of the Earth. Now, the, the probability of a civilization doing this is extremely small. Why would they do it? Uh, next slide is uh, a little uh, too much, I, I'd say. Uh, you may want to look at it later. It's, it's sort of summarizing all the sources of radio astronomy signals, starting with the moon and going uh, further distance to the cosmic background. And it's this uh, uh, overall view, what angle do these sources exist in? How far away? Roughly, what is the spectrum? to the source and what is the time variation. Uh, so it's just a, a capsule view of radio astronomy signals. Okay, punchline, how radio amateurs can help uh, uh, the uh, basic concept is that a number of collaborating amateurs observing the same signal separate locations mitigate the radio frequency interference. It is if, if uh, two people that are at least hundreds of kilometers apart see the same signal, uh, it, it still could be uh, interference, but most likely it's not. It, it's a sign that this may be extraterrestrial signal. So to do these, uh, the more the better, the more amateurs see the same signal and uh, we have time span. They, they uh, know exactly when they saw it, the millisecond uh, accuracy. Well, that, that they, they may have seen astronomical signal. Uh, uh, 
Uh, now, the, the, that breaks into two groups. One I call the all sky group. Uh, they don't have big antennas, they have, uh, I call them horns or dipoles that uh, have a pretty much hemispherical fields of view. They see most of the sky. Uh, and uh, they don't have much collective area because they're small antennas, but they're seeing the whole sky. So these 500 births a day that are getting the earth, uh, they would uh, receive those. Uh, whether, whether they have enough sensitivity to see them depends. Uh, 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 but a, a group, I, I would, you know, tens to a hundred who just have these small antennas but are synchronized and collaborate, uh, uh, that they could see, uh, they could detect the second group is what I call the targeted search group. Uh, these are, are uh, people who have uh, larger collective areas, say dishes of greater than three meter diameter. And they agree to point those dishes as a, a likely source. Uh, it, it could be the moon. Could be a nearby galaxy, a previously detected FRB. I told you that most of them don't repeat, but some of them do repeat. But the repetition, re repetition rate is not uh, periodic. And so uh, a lot of people can be looking in that direction of, of uh, a repeater and uh, Get a lot of people detecting uh, the source, get a location by interferometer. Uh, so, this is a, a uh, second way that uh, amateurs, there are many more amateurs than professional astronomers. So, that you have many more elements to the interferometer. Uh, astronomers. Okay. I now, let's see, it's, it's uh, uh, 10 o'clock here, 1 o'clock. Uh, uh, I am about halfway, right? Uh, I'm next going to move to uh, a different topic briefly. It's about very low noise receivers at ambient temperature. This is something I've worked on intensely for the past couple of years. And uh, I'll start by talking about system noise temperature, what counts as far as sensitivity of the receiving system. It's the total noise in the system, not just the noise in the LMA, and uh, how much it's worth improving the LMA depends upon what other noise you're adding to the system. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, then I'll describe the LMA that we have developed here at Caltech, uh, which has seven Kelvin noise at 1.4 gigahertz. This is about a factor of four lower than commercially available very low noise amplifiers. And so I'll describe how this was obtained. What, what is the rationale for the design? And how do we know we really measured that low noise? How does that calibrate? And we'll talk a little bit about what problems we ran into. We've now made about 150 of these low noise amplifiers, and they're used in an array that's out in uh, Northern California, Lowell Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Uh, okay. Uh, Uh, here it is. Uh, system noise. 
the important parameter to determine the system sensitivity. Uh, and uh, there's two columns there. It's, uh, what was the system noise in 2016? What is it now with this very low noise LMA? So you see the contributions to the system noise. The cosmic background, you can't do anything about that. We love it. Uh, but it's 2.7 Kelvin. It doesn't pay to build an LMA with a tenth of a Kelvin noise because uh, the cosmic background swamp the system noise. There's other contributions, there's other sources in the galaxy that can contribute a Kelvin or so. The atmosphere itself is not completely transparent. That's uh, L band at 1.4 gigahertz or so. The antenna is going to see some of the 300 Kelvin ground radiation. Uh, feed itself is in the beam of the parabolic reflector and reflects some of the noise back to the receiver. Uh, there's some loss in the feed. And finally, we come to the LMA, which in 2016 dominated the system noise, at least half of it. Now is uh, is comparable with the other components of the system. So there is the bottom line. 26 Kelvin is what we measure on uh, what's called the ESA 110 uh, uh, space array. Uh, uh, 110 antennas we, we are building at Coles Valley. And I think we have about uh, 40 to 50 of them in operation now. 26 Kelvin system noise. Uh, so think about the system noise, and you can measure the system noise very easily by putting a chunk of absorbing material in front of the feed, in front of the antenna. That generates 300 Kelvin. Put a thermometer in that absorbing material to make it a more accurate measurement. And pair that with the power received when it's not there, when you're looking for cold, cold sky. So all the other contributions are there. Uh, and, and this is called the Y factor method of measuring uh, receiver noise. I get a Y factor of two or three, but the power will change substantially if you put the 300 Kelvin absorber on the antenna. Uh, uh, now, this is just showing the antenna that uh, we're, we're building for this uh, ESA 110 array. And there is the feed, which uh, we have to thank. The amateur radio for the design. As we build large arrays in radio stops, we need inexpensive to manufacture. And uh, this, this is uh, uh, called the uh, high plate uh, antenna. Uh, the rings around a pipe are by. Uh, Cake plates because they're very expensive. And what you're seeing there at the bottom of the slide is the Y factor. Uh, the top trace is when the absorber is in front of the feed. And the bottom place uh, is when the feed is looking at the parabolic reflector looking at the sky. So that's a, uh, a DD scale. So you see about 10 dB Y factor in this case. And that that computes to a system temperature of about 46 Kelvin. So you can do this as a function of frequency. You can see the 
look at the sky, now at the bottom end of the band, where it looks like a couple of RFI. Uh, so that system temperature can be measured as a function of the zenith angle. So it's not temperature. And uh, as we get the temperature, even looking closer to the ground, we pick up more noise. Shown here, and got the two polarizations. I don't know why, but there's a little difference in noise and the two polarizations. All right, let's move on to what does this amplifier look like? So there you see it, uh, and you see what's inside uh, uh, the uh, Couple of other characteristics of the amplifier, other than its slow noise, it's powered by the output cable. The output cable has plus five volts on it. To save running other uh, cables uh, with the LMA. It's not just the cost of those cables, but preventing the RFI. The RFI getting into the piece of power is important. So uh, uh, this is this is, is uh, normally done on a lot of these things now. But you can, uh, bring the power in on the output line. Uh, the other uh, uh, unusual characteristic of the LMA is that it has a built-in calibration cell source. Uh, there is a noise diode that can be turned on by a tone on that output cable, a tone at uh, 32 kilohertz. Uh, so at 32 kilohertz, it doesn't uh, interfere with the received signal, which is uh, in the gigahertz range. Uh, and, it, and it can be separated from the plus five volts. And so <clears throat> what you see on the print circuit board is mostly circuitry to uh, distinguish that tone, to detect that tone, and make sure it's not something else. Uh, uh, and so uh, many of these have been built, and I'll show some more data on them in the next few slides. Uh, we tested them from plus 40 to minus 40 percent grade. Uh, data uh, on that. Uh, but the important thing was at minus 40, uh, the noise was uh, reduced by a factor of two. Uh, it has about four kelvin noise at minus 40. In the future, we're, we're thinking of wider band for noise amplifiers, which would use solid state coolers, healthy uh, coolers, to get to minus 40. The LMA has to be direct connected to the feed. So there's a, a cable with a tenth of the dB loss with add seven Kelvin system plus. So uh, you have to uh, support the LMA mounted by its type end connector right on the feed. Uh, okay, I think I've said. System noise and cryogenic receivers at a fraction of the cost. Cryogenic receivers typically they're, they're closed cycle coolers in the back of the chamber. And we're talking about at least $50,000 equipment to do that. So this is a big improvement on the cost. Uh, I mentioned the internal calibration for power. Uh, this is the test parameters of the LMA. Uh, on the left, blue is the gain. Uh, those are the frequency. The array operates 1.28 to 1.53 gigahertz. Uh, flat gain or noise over that band. The other test parameters input reflection coefficient, output reflection coefficient, shown here quite a bit. Uh, 
this is the measurement of the noise uh, both versus temperature. Uh, we have a uh, temperature controlled chamber, kind of a big refrigerator box uh, that uh, uh, we can run for minus 40 to plus 40. It takes a few hours to stabilize. Uh, but we uh, have measured many of these elements. That is surprising. Uh, that, that, that shows an effect in the transistor uh, that other people have seen but not realized. And if we thought it was a measurement error. Uh, but noise in the transistor brain uh, does vary rapidly. Measurement of that. Uh, uh, there's three uh, LMAs, uh, one frequency, one difference in measurement, uh, noise, uh, uh, it's one for the temperature. Uh, block diagram, what's in the LMA? Well, you may have guessed from what I've said. Uh, uh, there is a indium phosphide. High electron mobility transistor, a super good transistor the first stage. Uh, there is uh, two keys to this very well noise. One is a better transistor, the second is an input matching network with extremely low loss. Again, the 10 dB loss of the input network is the big exception. So you put matching network is uh, hundreds of loss. I'll show how that's achieved. Uh, there's been a conventional uh, and second stage. Uh, I should say the first stage is a chip. Uh, uh, the, the package of the transistor could contribute a few kilobytes. Chip on wire connected input network. The second stage is conventional, uh, it cost a dollar or so, very many circuits, plastic, plastic package system. Uh, it's a pretty conventional output matching network. And then you see the connection to the output connectors pull off for five volts. Uh, this voltage regulator uh, LMA to regulate the voltage. And then the detection of the 32 kilohertz tone. If you want that detection, it's yes or no. You don't want to have the noise, the calibration noise, determined by how strong uh, the turn on signal is. Uh, so that, that's all done. Uh, okay, getting to the, the transistor. Uh, this is the equivalent circuit of the transistor. It's a key part of, of designing the amplifier. It's, it's, uh, knowing the equivalent circuit of the transistor. And the best result of that is with a transistor made by a company called Ceramics. Uh, they're a small company, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, uh, they do a terrific job making this uh, transistor. Um, uh, they are also into making mimics now. One of the key parts of this transistor uh, is shown in the Microscope photograph of transistor. Look at the lower right hand corner. Now, in order to get this extremely low noise of uh, 1.4 gigahertz, 
sister which had gained up to the hundreds of deliveries. This drag consisted at max with the goes to one. It's about five hundred deliveries. Uh, well that's great, except uh, it can become unstable at higher frequencies. We're trying to design a 1.4 gigahertz amplifier, but if it has feedback at 100 gigahertz, it can oscillate 100 gigahertz. And uh, that feedback can be internal to the transistor. And what was a breakthrough three or four years ago was put in, in air bridge. Tell very well uh, what's in this transistor, but some of these uh, connections are air bridges between fingers that stabilize the transistor at hundreds of gigahertz. Excuse me a second, Sandy. Um, you have 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, the input network. It is similar to a coax line. It started with making a coax line input network, and uh, in order to accommodate the connection to the input connector and the transistor, we want a suspended substrate. So that there's a substrate of low loss material with a line on it. The rest of it is air. This, this is pretty big transistor, uh, one centimeter by one centimeter square box. Uh, calibration uh, realized that commercial noise sources are calibrated plus or minus 0.15 dB. If you're measuring a noise figure of one dB, that, that's okay. But if you're measuring a noise figure of 0.05 dB, plus or minus 0.15 not okay. It was an error of plus or minus 11 Kelvin in the noise. So we have to calibrate noise source. And uh, I, I've worked on that problem uh, for 40 years with this liquid nitrogen calibration source. Built an NRAO in a work year in 1970. Problem observed. I'll, I'll move kind of quickly here. Uh, it had water damage. The case uh, had O rings, but it has three surfaces that have to be sealed. And uh, got water on it. Uh, it also had problem cleaning. The little particles in the LMA they get trapped in those air bridges on the Further developments will help the a cooling. What you can see there, uh, this is a three stage thermoelectric cooler. Uh, this is about three millimeters uh, square here. Uh, and so the top plate cools to minus 40% of pressure. Uh, we've done some tests of that. Uh, the transistor cooled fine. Problem is water condensation. And uh, that was a harder problem than I first realized in the evacuated case. But even with dramatic sealing, if you want to have a good enough vacuum that, uh, say, over a 10 year life, you don't get the condensation problem. Uh, it becomes very difficult. All right. Uh, radio astronomy arrays. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to take enough time to say too much about it. It's essentially an interferometer. Two antennas look at the same source and you measure the correlation of the received signal. Uh, you can form a beam that's very sharp. Uh, and there's, there's two ways of doing this. Or 
Sammy. Let's see, I'm going to call up any of my post these pictures. Sorry. Images. Uh, and this is kind of a quick summary of some of the large arrays of astronomy. Look at this here. And uh, uh, this is a quick look at uh, another array uh, of Owens Valley called the Long Wavelength Array, operating in 20 to 85 megahertz length range. And just zooming in on what that array looks like. So those are dipoles. There's no dishes, this is a low frequency. And the theme of this array is all the sky, all the time. That is, these antennas have a hemispherical beam. They see most of the half of the sky at one time. Of course, the Earth rotates and that part of the sky changes. And uh, what you're showing here, the field of view of this array is the blue circle. Uh, that, that's uh, close to a hemisphere. Other telescopes uh, have sharp beams. They're much more sensitive. It's a low frequency. The signals are very strong. You can do a lot um, less sensitivity. Uh, this is a snapshot of what that array sees at one instant of time. This is the Milky Way. Uh, uh, and it's a movie which I have time to show, which just shows the Earth's rotation, shows the Milky Way so going overhead. These are some of the strong radio sources, Cass A and Cygnus. Uh, the sun is over on the edge uh, here. There's a burst that's uh, going on. Uh, so the, the new topic, the new array for Caltech. Uh, is a 2000 element version of uh, uh, an array that would operate, say, from 25 to 2 gigahertz. And, uh, a tremendous amount of astronomy can be done in that array. And uh, let's see, I have six minutes left. Uh, let me uh, run quickly through basic of noisy networks. And uh, uh, what I'm showing here is that you can have a network with many sources of noise, and you can represent that network by a noiseless network with two uh, noise sources. Uh, in this case, I show voltage sources, one at the input, one at the output. There's many sets of sources that can describe noisy network. You can have current sources. You can have a voltage source and a current source, both at the input. This is the most common used method of describing noisy transistor amplifier. Uh, uh, and I'm just saying that. Uh, once you know those four numbers, you can say what is the noise temperature of the amplifier for any generator in the peaks. The generator in the peak is here, there's a piece of the S source. The is, what is the optimal source of the peaks? Uh, if, if, when ZS equals the op, it's a hint, it will be noise. Oh, okay. Can I make a suggestion for the last five minutes of your talk? Yes. Uh, you could talk about how to get your amplifier out to the community, the amateur radio astronomy community. That is, if you build a hundred of them somewhere, you know, how would that work? The only thing I can say there is you need a good transistor and either ceramics or, uh, or ohmic manufacturers. They, they typically want to sell at least a hundred a time. 
Yeah. And it, it may be that, that if uh, some organization uh, pulls the needs, buys the hundred and then sells them. And that, how, that, that, how difficult is it? grow in the hundred dollar range. So how difficult is it to get a sponsor to, who's wealthy, oh, well, who, who doesn't mind uh, helping the community? Yeah. Uh, I'll leave that to, uh, to the community to figure out. I think there, there are companies that, that are. Are doing that. Uh, the uh, main uh, other point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, there, there's different source impedances for minimum noise and maximum gain. Uh, by source impedance, it means that people cannot design the uh, feed of a parabolic electrical port a horn to the sky. What I'm plotting here is gain versus uh, real part source impedance. That there is a value that matches. And then you get maximum gain there. The noise has a different value. Uh, uh, and uh, it's usually more important. Noise amplifier to get this minimum noise. Uh, well, this is a little bit about uh, uh, noise and distance, uh, but uh, uh, this first question that often and asked uh, the amplifier has a poor input power match, high PSWR, or this great system. Noise figure, not in itself. The noise figure does not depend on the input match. Most people don't uh, buy that. Uh, it's not intuitive that a lot of received power can be reflected by the amplifier and you still get lower noise. Why is that the case? Well, in simple words, some of the power from the transistor is getting transmitted. Out the antenna. The ratio of the internal noise to the signal turns the noise figure. So uh, uh, that. Uh, okay. Uh, I see I have, I'm about on time here. Uh, I could take some questions. Great timing. Um... Uh, I've got one from uh, Dave Westman. Uh, he wants to know about the uh, uh, the Starlink satellite communications or constellation. What do you think about the background noises on that when it's fully deployed? Uh, I I would like to uh, know the numbers. I I saw the YouTube video on taking apart the dishy. And it's a very well engineered. It's not a dish, it is a phased array. Uh, and uh, I don't know what the numbers are. I wonder what, uh, how good an LMA do they have. Of course, there are several frequencies that it operates at, uh, uh, some in the gigahertz range, some around 40 gigahertz. Uh, so I, I would like to know myself. Uh, what are its system characteristics? It's a marvelous system design job. If you think about uh, where do you place those satellites and how do they communicate with each other and how to make this dishy which sells for five hundred dollars has all these frequencies and phase array. Uh, marvelous engineering. Great. And uh, Les, um, you had three questions on there. I want to. Come on, come online and uh, and ask the questions direct. Are you saying you want us to speak the questions? Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I got less. Less is uh, first, and uh, Glenn, I you. I think you already asked your questions, Glenn. Uh, uh, unless you got uh, some more. Yeah, kind of. I was asking about price. How much does it cost for a hundred quantity? Okay. Hundred dollars. Um, hundred dollars. Yeah. 
That's great. That quick. All right. Last. Where are yes. you? Okay. Uh, sitting in the wilds of West Virginia ah. at a former satellite uh, systems design. Uh, I'll ask my last question first because it's apropos of the last comment. Uh, a great amplifier, but in the context of the uh, society, the amateurs, so to speak, how many of us think we've got antennas at L band with low enough side lobe temperatures uh, that would really benefit by the seven Kelvins? And I don't, I don't really think that's a question directed to you, but to the community at large before we get all excited. But I, I do have a question directly to you. And I believe I have seen this idea before at Green Bank, if not others. Uh, the, the condensation is a killer. Uh, have you considered high pressure dry helium in the package or could you not get it sealed well enough? Well, what I've considered is uh, high pressure xenon, which has uh, xenon and argon have uh, very low thermal conductivity, that is, they would be good insulators, not as good as vacuum, but better than nitrogen. Uh, the, the question about when you have high pressure inside, does that prevent the water vapor from leaking in? That is a physics question, which uh, not, not so uh, easy to answer. It depends on the leakage path. If the leakage is uh, permeation through Teflon, uh, the in that case, the pressure inside helps. Or no, no, I'm sorry, it's, it's the other way around. The pressure does not help. There's something called the law of partial pressures. Uh, the diffusion of the water vapor through the depth line will occur even though there's a high flow going the other direction. However, if the leakage path is a narrow channel, uh, uh, then uh, the, uh, the pressure inside uh, pushes on the, uh, the water vapor coming inside and it helps. So I, it, it's going to require test of leakage. It's a leakage due to Teflon or O-rings or micro cracks somewhere. Okay. I Understand and understand that my view of the subject is way too simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was uh, my, my problem too, I, I didn't realize. The, uh, the antenna at Owens Valley that you put this on, how the hell did you get only four Kelvins of side lobes out of that antenna? With, uh, uh, well-designed feed under illuminated the dish, right? You have a wide band feed, wide beam width feed, and it sees a lot of ground. But you get an optimum sensitivity feed, but it doesn't. That's, that's how the uh, Japanese used to give us good commercial antennas. Under illuminate and forget about the gain. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for uh, Sandy? Uh, how about uh, stability on the uh, amplifiers? Any tendency for them to oscillate at the slightest excuse? Uh, there's there's one uh, stability problem. Uh, it's at a very low frequency at 200 megahertz. Uh, the Antenna has a, a high reflection coefficient at those frequencies, so it's a cutoff wavelength. And uh, uh, the uh, LMA is first designed, uh, had, a, it had negative input impedance at 200 megahertz and uh, would oscillate. Uh, 
so that, that just requires some change of the uh, input connection network. It's now okay. I, I don't think we have this problem. Okay, anybody else? I, I got one more question. For those who are interested in building these amplifiers, perhaps Sandy could have another Zoom meeting, uh, you know, and anybody can attend and then they could chat about, you know, what does it take to have a group of people work on these? Um, we can, uh, I can I answer questions. If, if, if somebody <laughs> wants to take on the consolidation of buying the transistors for, for uh, yeah, uh, once you sell the amplifiers, let's start making them. But, but at the next step, there could be an informal conversation, Zoom meeting, not, and you could discuss that. But you may want to set that up now. You've got to go on to your next presenter right now, so you don't have time to get into that now. But okay. you, could, you could say, uh, you know, agree to a, a Zoom meeting sometime. Hi. could be tomorrow or something. Or. Hi, hi, Glenn. The, uh, um, uh, this is Rich. Uh, yeah, the, uh, if you want to do, Sandy, if you want to do that, just contact me. And uh, I have a monthly meeting with uh, this esteemed group and uh we can always have a, a another conversation on any topic of you want and there's lots of people who would love to uh uh grab any of your equipment and uh and plug it into their uh their antennas trust me you got a whole well, group of people who I are started drilling. with the largest dish which Wolfgang has a 25 meter right. and we're shipping you two LMAs they are ones that will leak water, and we can't use them. So keep them dry. Keep, keep the water off of them. Uh, but they are Southern Kelvin elements. Yeah, that, that goes to Les's thing. I think Wolfgang's antenna is the uh, the uh, best antenna so far in the, in our group. And uh, uh, you're next, right? You have an 18. -meter. I've got I've got an 18 meter. I'd love to I'd love to get your. Uh, Okay. Well, nice too. So, and, and there's a couple other 18 meters in the group, and then uh, then you start working your way down. I think Skip Curley's drooling over it, and I know Charles wants to get a hand, his hand on it because he tests these things. So there's a, there's a bunch of people who would love to uh, just love your work. And uh, okay, so um, no more questions, uh, Sandy. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question, Sandy. Uh, what about the oscillations at the upper frequencies? How do you uh, manage that? Those, uh, those bridges in the transistor seem to take care of that. Okay. We, we, we uh, haven't had that problem. He neutralized the amplifier. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. Yeah, Rich, uh, tell him about the uh, honorary membership. Well, uh, go ahead, Charles. Okay. Uh, Sandy, uh, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers has uh, voted to make you an honorary member. Thank you very much. It, it, it is an honor. I appreciate uh, it. Hope you'll join us more often. Okay. Yep. S Sandy, I would also like to say thank you for providing us with the, your LNAs. We're looking forward to receive that, and we hope to get great results with that. And it was my pleasure listening to your talk today. Okay, well, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, everybody, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sandy. I think uh, you and uh, your and Glenn and uh, I think Marjorie uh, are free to stay on. Uh, and uh, join us for the next two days on this conference and uh, enjoyed your talk and enjoyed the questions, uh, Glenn. Uh, like you're, uh, uh, you're well into this. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I've been, uh, in, starting at age five, I went into the laboratory with, with my father in the evenings and weekends. So I, I grew up in the laboratory. All right. I was in Green Bank in, in the early days of the NRAO. I ran around the telescopes when I was four years old. All right. So sounds like day. sounds like you need to be in this society too. So uh, let us know. Well, I, I can help you folks as far as building a hundred batch. Um, right. I have a company ah. that does that, that is uh, manufacturing. Not that I'm building them, but I can. If there's a meeting you want to talk about to building a hundred and getting them out to the community, we could I could be involved in this, right. this, this conversation Volunteer. about that. Well, not so much to do the work, but let's just say a meet, you know, an informal <laughs> conversation about how that might work. All right, you could, you guys contact me, and uh, we can set up a meeting. We got lots of people who probably be interested in uh, in uh, 
your stuff and uh, just uh, thank you very much, for Sandy. Uh, great talk, and uh, wish I had given you more time, but uh, that's uh, you could probably talk for, for hours. <laughs> sure. So okay, all right. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>